So we're here at the Computex 2014. So who are you? I'm Noel Hurley. I run the uh, CPU group at ARM. So running the CPU group at ARM, does that mean you take care of all the processors? Or? Yeah, all of the Cortex processors, the Cortex A's, the Cortex R and the Cortex M processors. Uh, t taking care of them, what does that mean? Oh, so um, th we're organized such that uh, I have uh, product marketing and uh, engineering all in one group that we call the CPU group. So that's all the engineering functions. Um, as well as all the, the product marketing from a product definition um, and promotion perspective. So that means uh, you're organizing engineer groups around the world? That's right, yes. We have uh, CPU design centers in Cambridge in the UK where the headquarters is. Uh, we have another group in Austin, Texas and uh, a group in Sofia in the south of France. And um, on Monday at this show we announced that we were going to open up a design center in uh, Shinju in, in Taiwan. So Shinju is a city, uh, it's kind of like San Jose of uh, Asia or what, what's going on, what goes on in Shinju? Yeah, when we were looking at uh, where we would open up a design center we looked uh, at various locations around the world and, and um, Taiwan has a, a pool of uh, engineers. Um, we have many of our top semiconductor partners here in, uh, in Taiwan, particularly in Shinju. Um, so this location is, is close to where the customer base is um, and also close to where there's a lot of activity, uh, semiconductor activity going on. There's a pool of engineers, as I said, and also in, in Taiwan there's a, a long history of, of some very good research institutes as well. So for us that means that we can have a continued flow of, of engineers um, to allow us to build up uh, the design centre. So you're getting a building over there and you're going to fill it up with engineers? Absolutely, yeah. So we have a few engineers um, already uh, doing uh, support activities around um, process and, and um, uh, implementation of CPU cores. We're now um, starting to do CPU design. So yes, we'll be needing a, a new location, um, a new office, a larger office, and um, as we start to recruit. So hiring engineers uh, for designing chips, is that something you do? Yeah, well actually more specifically it's, it's hiring engineers to design CPUs um, rather than uh, general chip design. So it's, it, it is a, um, a specialist area. Yeah. And uh, chip design, oh no sorry, CPU designers are uh, kind of like the most intelligent people in the world or how does it work? I mean it's, it's pretty hard. Ha it's hardcore stuff, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty demanding. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, I'm sure there are any, any silicon uh, and uh, system on chip design engineers, uh, well, I'm not going to comment on, you know, who's brighter than who, um, but there is, in, uh, is, you know, CPU design is, is a particular um, expertise and then, you know, it's more to do with people's motivation and what they find interesting and and uh, and fun. How do you become a CPU designer? Do you have to go to, through a very long school or? Uh, most of, uh, if not all of, all of the guys who are in our existing CPU teams are um, graduates with a computer science degree. Uh, but you need experience in some really high level uh, how it works. The the world of tiny, small things. Yeah, well, you need to understand how CPUs work. So, um, and and we're looking for in the new design center a mix of experience, um, uh, people who've done CPU design before, um, but also looking at, at, at more general engineering. Uh, you know, a high caliber of, of of engineers. So specifically in Taiwan, you want to focus a little bit on on the small cores, on the wearable and IoT, right? That's right, so um, for this design center we are focusing in on um, the Cortex-M series um, primarily because we are investing in the, the IoT in wearable market which is uh, very where the Cortex-M cores are, are very applicable to that marketplace. We're looking, to, for the, looking at the future of IoT um, and what we need to do to build CPUs for the next generation of, of IoT products. 
So that means uh, uh, things are all over the, the world, like billions of things that are going to be like very, very, very low power, even more than what, what what's available now. Like the Cortex M0 Plus and all that, it needs to be different somehow, more, even more of that. Exactly. So, so there is uh, there's a continuous desire to improve performance, improve power efficiency because these things have to be ultra power efficient. So that that is a continuous process. Um, but as we look forward, also we're looking for um, we're looking to drive DSP performance and also looking at issues like security and authentication because for, for these IoT devices you know, they have to be secured and authenticated on the network so looking at efficient ways of handling that in, in, in future generations of cores. I'm guessing that in, in the strategy of how you design, design C, uh, CPUs uh, it's quite important to make all your partners happy some, some way each by themselves where they each have a way to innovate in their own and yes. still based on your design also. Uh, so how do, you, how, do you, it's how do you balance the specifics of the architecture? And um, well of course our, our whole business model is about um, we do the CPU design um, and some of the subsystem around the CPU, but then we leave the rest of the of the the chip um, for our semiconductor partners to differentiate, um, and and they will do that a number of ways. By firstly, which market are they addressing, and therefore that will drive the peripheral sets, the um, what we term PPA power performance area characteristics that they're looking for. For that marketplace, so there is plenty of room there for for our semiconductor partners to differentiate, and that's important, I think, for them to for um, in terms of how the market uh, evolves, so that you have in opportunities to innovate, lots of innovation um, and lots of differentiation, so that we can get you know bluntly interesting different um, products in the future. But they, so they can all differentiate, but at the same time they all stay compatible. Is that the big challenge? Yeah, for you I mean, to one of the like that? exactly. One of the advantages is um, uh, with this with this model is, of course, if the software is consistent, then you're able to reuse software um, developed uh, through the community. Um, so that helps with development time and the development cost for a complete system. And uh, how do you facilitate or help the, the, the companies that have architecture license and they want to differentiate even more? Is that mostly the big cores or could it also be the small cores? Um, it, it, it could be, it could be the small cores. It, it has tended to be um, the big cores. Uh, when we do architecture licenses with people, um, it tends to be companies that have uh, a very strong um, CPU design background and they're looking to try and take the ARM architecture into a different space. Um, so in that case they'll want to design a processor that is um, they want to take advantage of the compatibility with the rest of the ARM ecosystem um, but at the same time they want to develop the core that is more specific to the market that they want to go into. Um, so that that desire has been mostly at the, at the high-end Cortex-A and very high-end processors. Um, but you know, it, I, I can see in the future that um, um, there may be a desire to uh, also uh, approach a market in the same way at the low end. Um, of course, what we aim to do is make sure that ARM itself is designing the right CPUs for the, for the cores in, uh, in the future. So. So, so we're in 2014, right? And there's uh, some 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 people talking about the acceleration of innovation, like mm -hmm. the Singularity University talking about like robots taking over soon or something. But okay, yeah. but uh, how do you keep up with the? Uh, is is it accelerating? Like, do you, how can you keep up with innovating faster and faster? Um, well, you 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 have to keep up um, and and continue to innovate and. Um, um, you know, if you don't, uh, you close up shop and eventually go away. Um, so yes, you have you have to keep innovating. Um, at ARM, when we're doing CPU design, we are having to think into the future a little bit more because when we look at 
the development time scales that we have, we have to develop the microprocessor. Um, that processor then goes into a, a system on chip. Uh, that takes time. That system on chip then has to be into boards and into OEM. So it can be as long as five years from CPU design through to end product. Uh, so when we're doing our uh, planning our roadmap, we are having to think sort of five years ahead of the marketplace to understand what is the market going to be needing in that time frame. Uh, does the C CTO do something different in that area, like uh, forward thinking? Uh, yeah, well, we have, uh, yes, we have a, a, a research and development uh, group that is thinking even further into the future and, and doing various experiments uh, on different architectures on, uh, on, um, and different technologies, yes. Is a quantum computer, uh, is that compatible with ARM? Or like all these future things that some people are talking about sometimes? Um, could be the future? I don't know about specifically quantum computing. Um, we'll see, but then um, we're focused more on um, some of the nearer term issues around um, uh, DSP, uh, media processing, um, security, as I mentioned, security authentication, how that scales out in, uh, in the future. So we tend to take a, a very um, we're looking specifically at the, at the processing needs and the processor needs um, and future SOC designs. Are you designing processors to optimize for heterogeneous uh, computing yeah, more than not monotonous? We are a, we're, a, um, we're an advocate of heterogeneous computing, um, the concept where you have different processors for different types of tasks. Uh, today, we use, uh, we have uh, big little technology where we have large cores that we mix with small cores and switch tasks between the two depending on the performance and, and, and the power profile you want to achieve. And we're also mixing um, on the GPU side, adding compute into our GPUs. So we have GPU compute plus the CPUs and, and again being able to offload the right task onto the right type of processor. And as we look to the future, then you can start to see that there are, um, you know, different types of processing elements, if you like, um, uh, that will go into SOCs to, to to perform, you know, whether it be media processing, whether it be you know some kind of stream processing, whatever. How do you feel about ARM uh, being so uh, important for uh, like uh, what's called uh, innovation and, and enabling the ecosystem of innovation all over the world? It's pretty amazing, no? Oh yes, I mean we've had a, um, um, a tremendous um, growth in the organisation and a tremendous growth in the ARM ecosystem over uh, the, the last few years. Um, back end of 2013, at the end of 2013 we celebrated with our semiconductor partners uh, 50 billion ARM based chips being sold into the marketplace which is uh, you know, an, an astonishing achievement by everyone in the ecosystem. All right, and collaborating for the 100 billion? Like yes, and now, and now we've, we, we at the show, um, again meeting with a number of our semiconductor partners, and Simon gave a talk about um, how we're now setting the target to collaborate to the 100 billion, I guess, is the next, is the next target to try and achieve. Question. <laughs> As you, it was uh, it was announced last week. Intel and Rockchip doing some work together. It wasn't fully announced exactly what they were doing. So, uh, like all of us, we can kind of guess. Um, from an R perspective, Rockchip is a is a great partner of ours and continues to be a great partner of ours. Um, and you see the growth. Um, especially in China and Taiwan and Asia, of phones and tablets. And Rockchip's been at some of the centre of that. And will continue to be in the centre of that, and will continue to be a very strong arm partner. For ARM, we see this, this market growing. And almost Intel starting to follow what we've started to do in some of these areas. Whereas 10 years ago, people said, Intel was leading, now they're starting to, to follow some of our ideas. I think we continue to grow and I think we continue to compete. 
Uh, this doesn't really change the dynamics of how we're competing together. Um, effectively, it says that Intel would like some of that tablet market, but we've known that for a while. Good question. I think it just endorses that partnership is the way forward. And it doesn't change our relationship with Intel one little bit. More importantly, it doesn't change our relationship with Intel. Partnerships are looking to develop, and what type of wearable devices uh, will they go into? Yeah. So, I'll, I'll start. The, the vast amount of wearables that you will find on the market now are based. So we don't build chips, but we design IP that goes in there. The IP that we're developing in labs goes from very low end, low power, as, uh, as Noel was talking about, nanowatts, technology, um, really the smallest core you can get, the most energy efficient core you can get. Uh, we're, we're talking to companies of how you link radios into that and making sure that that all works together all the way through to some of the technologies around Big Little that we talked about in the phones, how do you scale that into wearable devices as well. So lots of scaling, so we hit all parts of that um, segmentation from the, from the low end all the way through to the high end. And again, it depends on what you want to run on it, whether you want to run a rich operating system, um, a Linux or an Android or something, or an RTOS at the very deep low end. Just, just to, to, to supplement that, so um, when we're designing next generation CPUs, obviously the types of tasks that the market is demanding is, is, is clearly um, forefront in our minds as to when we're designing the next course. So when I look at a trend like wearables um, and, and trends like sensor hubs, that you're starting to see in, in, in mobile and, and many of the wearable devices are, are sensor hubs with an applications processor. When I look at the sensor hubs, the types of tasks that you're looking at it is things like DSP function, functionality, where you are trying to read data off sensors and pre-process that data in a very energy efficient way. So what we're seeing is things, uh, so energy management within the applications process is becoming increasingly important and then down as close to the sensor as possible is doing much more of the DSP um, and, and maths on, on the data so that you can run, um, you can keep most of the system off, you're only sending a minimal amount of data upstream to be processed, those types of things. So in terms of thinking about how we're developing our processes going forward, obviously things like DSP functionality is going to be important for sensor data and, and, that, and that energy management. And then at the extreme end, the very top end, is things like thermal management when you're trying to push the limits in terms of performance.